Ok. Uh... Yeah, ok. I'll, I'll do my best. Hi. Good evening, everybody. I think we could start. We, got, we have quite a bit to cover. I was going to try and talk to you without the mic, but the other alternative is I stay put here and not jump around even when I become very enthusiastic. So I'm going to leave the jumping about to you, and I'll stand here. If I move that way, just remind me and say, get back into your box. OK, so there were some questions uh, after yesterday's talk, but I think I'll do today's talk. And then uh, those of you who have asked questions can come and see me after the talk, and I'll, I'll pick up yesterday's talk and deal with those questions. So we're going to carry on with what it means to be human. And yesterday we went on that four billion year journey starting right here and going right up to the current. Now, the history of the Earth in terms of geological time is divided into eons, which are then divided into eras, which are in turn divided into periods, epochs, and ages. Now, an eon is an indefinite period of time, so I suppose you know, if you think of an eon, you're thinking of the entire four billion years. And of course, you get the pre-Cambrian pre pre period. And then the Cambrian period, which was a particularly important period in history of our planet because of a change in the form of living things that took place there. And the increase, the sudden increase, after a long time of very little happening, the sudden increase of multicellularity. So yesterday we, we stressed quite a bit about unis, unicellular organisms. Multicellularity started during that Cambrian period. And Stephen Jay Gould of Harvard is the man to read uh, about this period, because he, he, more than anybody else, was the greatest expert on that. And then there's an era which is a long and distinct period of history, and here you have the major eras. You can see that? And a period is a, is a length or portion of time, and we are what is considered to be the quaternary period. And the epoch we are in, according to this diagram, is the Holocene. Some people say, no, today we are in the Anthropocene period because we are dominating this planet and systematically destroying it. So, Africa is considered to be the cradle of mankind, humankind, and the most recent book that I've read is by Christia Kuljan called Darwin's Hunch. She's a research associate at WISER, the Wits Institute for Social and Economic Research, and I was so fascinated with this book. She had worked, interestingly, with Stephen Jay Gould at Harvard and came back to Wits and wrote this book, which is not about so much about the fossils of Africa as much as it's about the personalities, the superstars who were involved in actually unearthing the fossils and analyzing and interpreting their value. So I wrote um, two reviews on it, one in the South African Medical Journal and another one, a longer one, in the South African Archaeological Bulletin. And uh, I feel that this book is a must read if you're interested. And of course, there, is the out, there are two major hypotheses of how this planet became inhabited by human beings. The first one is the out of Africa hypothesis. The other one is a multi-regional hypothesis. And as we go along, we'll talk about that. OK, I just want to get some definitions right. Pre-humans, the earliest forms are hominids, and the later forms are hominins. Uh, sorry, this I think should end hominins. I think it might have been nim. Anyway, hominid, the group consisting of all modern and extin extinct great apes, that is modern humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans, plus all their immediate ancestors. But this group is the group consisting of modern humans. 
extinct human species and all our immediate ancestors that we'll be talking about now, including members of the genera Homo, Australopithecus, Paranthropus, and Ardipithecus. I love the sound of these names. Okay. Now, why do we want to study the past? Why is money being spent on, on exploring the past in a country which has <clears throat> so many pressing challenges? This question is asked from time to time, so we have to touch on the politics of the science. But this sort of work is about more than just supporting the academic exercise and in chronicling ancient events. It has lessons for us. It can change attitudes and responses to fundamental issues facing South Africa and societies everywhere. And these lessons relate to discrimination, particularly that based on race, and the rapid human-induced loss of natural environments and biodiversity. Okay. Now, the story of us. This diagram I got from science. If, for those of you who are in the scientific field, science would be considered to be one of the desirable journals that you'd want to publish in uh, to enhance your career. Okay? And I found, through all the years of reading about this, I found this diagram to be absolutely wonderful. So I thought I'm going to spend probably two or three minutes on this. Okay? So let's just look at it. On the x-axis here, oh, by the way, Chris Stringer, used to be the curator of the Natural History Museum in London. I've never heard of Julia Whitham, but I suppose she's an assistant of his. Uh, and, 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 and Chris has come to South Africa. He spoke the last time he was here, he spoke at the University of Western Cape. Now, in this diagram, on the x-axis, we, we're not going back four, mil, four billion years anymore. We're talking about the last 800 million years. Okay, so if you see here, 800 million up to now, up to quite recently. Okay, now, if you look at this tree, I'm going to call it a little tree. This brown here, you see that? Yes. And relate that to this map here. So that's round about up to number one. That's where the ancestral species started. Okay, and that was Darwin's hunch. Christian Christia Kuljian's book is entitled Darwin's Hunch. His hunch was that humankind originated in Africa. So here they are, and it's an ancestral species. But if you look at the, 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 the European and Eurasian continents, right, there's a bit of green there, and there's a bit of this light color there. So here, are the early signs of the beginnings of the Denisovans. You've heard of them? Okay, and over here, there are, why is this? Okay, and over here, the origin of the Neanderthals. So those with Denisovan traits and Neanderthal traits are actually not in Africa, but in Eurasia. But the ancestral species is still in that region, around them. Okay? But most of the ancestral species up to this point are in Africa. Okay. As you move further up, there is a branch here, and it branched out to Europe. Okay? But over, so over here, these, this was the beginning, as I said, of the Denisovan and the Neanderthal. You can match the colors to this map. Right? Now, look what happened in the second stage, and that is about between 300,000 and 200,000 years ago, number two. If you look at our continent again, there are three green spots, and those green spots talk of Homo sapiens. Okay? And those green spots, this is Morocco, East Africa, which includes Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, and Southern Africa right at the tip. So some things began to happen there which brought about change from ancestral species to the green, which is the Homo sapiens. 
Okay. Now, there's a huge, there's been a huge search for fossils here. And I can't talk about all the fossils found on the continent tonight. I just want to remind you again that every talk I give is just a representation of a huge amount of material, which would take me about three or four weeks to do as a course. Now, here in southern Africa, at the cradle for humankind, and in other areas around it, and around about Pelican Point and Mossel Bay. So those are the areas we're talking about here. And then the East Africa, where the Louis Leakeys were, the Leakeys, Louis and Mary Leakey, and up north in Ethiopia and in other parts, there were people, anthropologists from the United States, uh, Alan Johansson and Tim White and others. So they, 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 they worked there. Now, at this point, between 300,000 and 200,000 years ago, Denisovan traits became stronger and so did Neanderthal traits. So this was, these two were branches and they went that way and that way, whereas Homo sapiens began in Africa. Now what this tells you is if Homo sapiens began in Africa, you would ask, well, where did these Denisovans and Neanderthals come from? Because the Homo sapiens hadn't as yet left Africa. Well, this were the products of an earlier migration. There, may, there might have been many earlier migrations. Okay? So, in the third, in the third era, around about 70,000 years ago, the Neanderthal and the Denisovan traits continue to develop and spread, and Homo sapiens begins to emerge across Africa, and Africa and Eurasia remain isolated. That's number three, and number four, alternatively, okay, oh sorry, in number three, Homo sapiens traits evolve in Africa, Homo sapiens disperse into Eurasia at about this time, about 70,000 years ago, and that's the migration everybody talks about, okay? Now, what happened over there is they might have been interbreeding when they came into this part of the world. There was interbreeding between Homo sapiens and uh, the Neanderthals. There is no indication as yet of interbreeding between Homo sapiens and the Denisovans, okay? And today, of course, if you look at it, Homo sapiens dominates the Earth. What happened to the others? The, the species that's not mentioned here is Homo florensis. What happened to the others? And that's a very good question. Did we kill them off as we met them? Or did they die out because they couldn't actually adapt to new environments and new uh, weather conditions? We don't know. Okay, whatever it is, this 70,000 years ago was the out of Africa migration. They were our ancestors. They father the entire human race subsequently, and there's only one race, the human race, and Dawkins tells it very bluntly, we are all Africans. No excitement? <laughs> then I'll have some water. Okay, now, it's interesting that the first fossil finds, you know, there are not many fossils that have been found. There's an increasing number now over the years. But fossils, the fossil story has a lot of gaps in it. And people try and put it together as new findings come along. So there were earlier finds in the Neander Valley near Dusseldorf in Germany in 1856, okay? And in Java by Eugene Dubois in 1891, eventually named Homo erectus, uh, but previously named something else. I think it was Peking Man or, or no, it was Sinanthropus Boise or something. Those finds were a threat to Darwin's hunch that humans originated in Africa. Okay? Now, for anybody to say at that time that humans originated in Africa was heresy. So Europeans didn't take kindly to that. And so they created the Piltdown Man one of the biggest hoaxes in the history of science in 1908, in which they found, they claimed they found, 
the missing link between the ape and the human, because one part of the jaw was uh, the ape jaw and the top, top jaw was the human jaw. And that actually endured over decades. Okay? It was only declared a hoax in 1953. And Darwin's suggestion 40 years before that Africa was the most likely birthplace of humankind was ignored while everybody fussed about Piltdown Man. There was a Victorian revolt against the idea that Africa was the cradle of humankind. The idea that humans were related to an African ape caused an uproar in Victorian England. Descended from the apes, my dear, let us hope that it's not true. But if it is, let us pray that it will not become generally known. Okay. Now, I want to talk a bit about the superstars of the story, and I'm sticking to Southern Africa. I'll mention a few others, but I think the man to start with is Raymond Dart. He was born in 1893, and he came to Johannesburg as the head of anatomy. So he walked into this town, which was absolutely dreadful. He went to Witts University, which was absolutely dreadful. I mean, he just couldn't believe that he was posted there. And he didn't think that he'd be able to do anything in this backwater of the world. Okay? He was Australian by nationality and an anthropologist, best known for his involvement in the 1924 discovery of the first fossil ever found, Australopithecus africanus. This was a turning point in the history of anthropology. An extinct hominin closely related to humans, a town in the north of South Africa in the, in the Northwest province, right? And this was in 1924, and these are the skulls. And I saw one at the Natural History Museum in London, and I felt terrible because the original is in the Transvaal Museum in Pretoria, okay? And this has become one of the icons of the story. Okay, and it's been written about very much. If you read Philip Tobias's Into the Past, or Tobias in Conversation, which I reviewed in the South African Archaeological Bulletin, or this book here, a lovely book, Born in Africa by Martin Meredith, and of course Darwin's Hunch. Okay? They all talk. Nicholas, do your thing. So it's very bright here, you're saying. OK. That's worse. Nicholas, that's worse. More? I think switch those off there, Nicholas. Yeah. Now these here. Yeah. Can you turn these off? Ah, here we are. Oh, you want some light? Okay. I, I thought you said give us some light so I can see a black man in the dark. <laughs> uh, that's fine. That's perfect. Okay. Can you see these now? I don't have to go through them again? Okay. So, this is Australopithecus Af uh, Africanus. Australopithecus or Australopithecus means a sudden ape, a man-like ape. Dart was convinced that he had found the missing link between the ape and the human, right? It had a high domed forehead, no eyebrow ridges like you see in apes, lightly built, lower jaw, small teeth, face flat and not protruding it, and position of foramen magnum, upright posture. That means it must have been bipedal. The foramen magnum is a hole here through which the spinal cord passes and goes into the brain. And in apes, it's in a position up here. For us, it's here, so we have to be bipedal for our spinal cords to pass through. Okay? So there's a cast. Uh, they made a cast out of it, a natural mold of the inside of a skull. 
They made a replica of a brain three times the size of a baboon, so it was midway between a baboon and a human. And what Dodd did was very unusual. Within a year, he had it published in Nature, and newspapers worldwide interviewed him, and even the local newspapers, the Star of Johannesburg, covered this story. Okay? Now, usually, when you hear of any new discovery these days, you'll find that the people who found that skull or that bone take about an average of 10 to 15 years before they report it. You have to be very, very careful. Dart just rushed into it. Now, it had to go before the experts. And of course, the experts, we Africans have, a very, have an inferiority, inferiority complex. So the experts were all in, in Europe, in England and Scotland. Sir Arthur Keith, Grafton Elian Smith, Sir Arthur Smith Woodworth. And apparently, I heard Philip Tobias speak at UCT once, where he was trying to suss out who could have been responsible for the Piltdown hoax. And these three were mentioned as possibilities. <laughs> OK. Anyway, but they heavily criticized Dart. They said, your study was too preliminary. It was just extravagant speculation. Missing link between ape and human. The brain size was too small. It was 520 mils. It should have been at least 800. And then Dart gave them no sci info on the site's stratigraphy. So usually people say, we found it in this particular area, and this was the kind of rock it was embedded in. This is how it was blasted out, and it could have damaged a part of it. He said nothing of that sort. So they said, it's not a missing link. Africa cannot be cradle, the cradle of humankind. You should come over, Dart, and look at Piltdown Man. So the refusal by the Europeans to recognize Dart's find could be interpreted as jealousy about its African origin. At a conference in London, attended, attended by all these big superstars of England, Smith Woodward, Dart's mentor Grafton Elliot Smith, and Sir Arthur Keith, the focus was on Piltdown Man and not on Australopithecus. And Dart felt terrible. He became, actually became very depressed and refused to attend future meetings. Okay? When he arrived at Wits in 1923, in 1924, he discovered this. And then he was succeeded by Philip Tobias as the chair of anatomy in 1959. And all that time, his finding wasn't recognize, recognized. OK. He was an odd man, Raymond Dart. Um, he disagreed with historians that Great Zimbabwe was an African achievement. He didn't think Africans could achieve anything. He was in the habit of commenting on features of others with remarks such as, well, there's a bit of smidgen of Negro there, a touch of Boscop in it. He wouldn't have survived in today's climate. In the Kalahari, he and his colleagues employed the most demeaning of practices on women, measuring the external genitalia. And that was a, 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 a habit, uh, a practice shared by others. And the accumulation of fat on the buttocks of females. And this was behavior reminiscent of the sexual obsession Europeans held of African women in the 1600s. And you can recall Sati Bartman. Dart's ideas on evolution and race were influenced by the British, and he was trained in the tradition of comparative anatomy, which based racial differences on physical traits. Dart did not believe that the human race was one. Okay? Now, when I wrote the review of Tobias's book, Philip Tobias was a little upset with me and said to me, you should remove some of the um, unpleasant characteristics about Raymond Dart. So I said to him, I got it from your book. He says, yes, I know, but I think you've been a little too selective in your review. Uh, and it, 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 it creates too much emphasis on Dart's weaknesses. So that, sorry? I can't, I can't hear you, sir. Now, 
Though the race is actually a social construct, it's a political thing. There's only one race, and that's the human race. But at this stage, when they were doing these searches, they believed that races were separate, that there was an ancestor for different races. And it influenced their work. They set out to find those differences. They only came to terms with the idea that there's only one race much later. Okay? So, um, so, 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 so let us go back then to the last 65 million years, um, which is easier to go to. So in the last 65 million years until today, so we had prosimians and, and monkeys, which we still have, okay? And at some point, um, at about, what, about 40 million years ago, there was the last common ancestor of monkeys and apes, which lived about 25 million years ago, okay? So that was at this point. And then if you carry on, you get the great apes, okay? You get first get the lesser apes and then the great apes, and then eventually you come to the chimpanzees and the bonobos, which are the great apes. And from there to there, you get the human race. Now, so there was a last common ancestor of these two, and then there was a divergence. Apes continued to be apes, and then there was a divergence into humanity. Okay? Now, if you look at it here, Okay, so here we have an ape, and then as we come along, at about 7 to 13 million years ago, you get full bipedalism. I don't know where this arrow, okay, here. You get full bipedalism. So this is actually a, 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 a kind of missing link because you have stopped walking on all fours. He's probably walking half on all fours and half on his feet, and here you get full bipedalism. Okay, so this is where the divergence of apes and humans took place. So you, some books say six to eight million years ago. In this case, they're saying seven to 13 million years ago. Now, if you looked at just a little further up here, where more human-like characteristics began to emerge. The first species was Ardipithecus, no, Sahelanthropus chadensis. It was a skull found in Chad, okay? And it seemed to have more human-like features and increasingly human-like features, although it still retained a lot of its ape characteristics. So that's this one here. They call him To My Man or Sahelanthropus chadensis. Now, a lot of people think that once you've sort of diverged from the apes, you're going to look something like this. It's not like that at all. It's still very ape like, in apish in appearance. And then, furthermore, as we're coming closer to humanity, you had Aldipithecus ramidus. Now, these were found by. Tim White and Alan Johansson in East Africa, in Ethiopia, and in Chad, okay? After that, you had Australopithecus anamensis, and I need to tell you about this particular one because she was called Lucy, and at that time, it was about the most complete skeleton that they could have found, and they found it in the Hadar region in the Afar Triangle of Ethiopia. It was found by the Americans, and they got a lot of mileage out of it. Her name was Lucy because as they were laying out the bones, as they were laying out the bones on the ground, the song was, a song was playing on their transistor radio called Lucy in the Sky with Glasses. It was a Beatles song. <laughs> oh, Lucy in the Sky with Glasses. And, 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 and it was a Beatles song, and so they named her Lucy. And then after that, so... That was one very interesting point. And after that came Homo habilis. Now, there's an enormous history, because now we're moving away from the other genuses, right? Sahelanthropus, Ardipithecus, Australopithecus, Anamensis, which is Lucy, and now we've come to Homo 
happiness. Now that has been an extremely interesting but very controversial find. When Philip Tobias worked for Raymond Dart, Raymond Dart didn't allow Philip Tobias to look at any of the fossils. He said to Tobias, your job is to teach anatomy. And so the Leakeys found this one, Homo habilis, and they wanted, they invited Philip Tobias to describe it. Philip Tobias took on the task quite reluctantly, and there is much speculation in the literature that he was pressured by the Leakeys, who were very domineering, pressured by them into giving it the genus Homo. So that was a turning point. But we don't know. Tobias denies that later in his books. And then, of course, we had uh, other Australopithecines here, and we come to Homo erectus. Now, when we spoke earlier on about where did those Denisovans and Neanderthals come from, there must have been a migration of Homo erectus prior to the migration 70,000 years ago of Homo sapiens. Okay? And Philip Tobias actually believed that language could have started with Homo erectus, but that is not confirmed. Okay, so let's put them in order again. So we had the ancestor, okay, and we had here the first one, which was Sahelanthropus, and then we had Ardipithecus ramidus, and then we came to an Australopithecine, which is Anamensis, and then Afarensis was Lucy. So Lucy caused a lot of stir. A lot of people were frustrated that from the point of divergence, six to eight million years ago, to Ardipithecus, we still haven't come to that point where the actual divergence took place. And they're hoping to find some kind of fossil or skull that will say, this is the point at which the, the divergence between apes and humans took place. Okay? Anyway, so we had afferences, and that was very good, and then Raymond Dart's Australopithecus africanus. And then there were variations of this, and this was described by Robert Broom, whom I'll talk about just now, and these actually then went extinct. And these were more uh, herbivores, and they had very strong jaws and very strong teeth. So they don't fall into the line of going up to us. We go up this way. Now, when they draw branches and trees like this, it's a speculation. Each time they find something new, they try and fit it into the picture, and then try and wonder, is she in the line of our ancestry? Is she in the direct line of our ancestry? We don't know, okay? And then after Homo habilis came Homo erectus, and then of course Homo erectus made some migrations and produced Neanderthals, and eventually 70,000 years ago, our ancestors went out of Africa and colonized the entire planet. Okay, now, just the other day, what, what date was that? In January, was it a, a science evolution amongst it? It says 21st to 23rd of January 2019, which we haven't as yet come to, but that's the date on the journal. <coughs> Janet Kelso. Janet Kelso says Neanderthals are still among us, okay? And she realizes eight years ago. She made a momentous discovery that Neanderthals repeatedly mated with the ancestors of modern humans. That means Homo sapiens. A finding that implies people outside of Africa still carry Neanderthal DNA today. And just remember, that's confined to people in Europe and Eurasia. No Neanderthal uh, genes in Africans. So ever since then, Kelso has wondered exactly what modern humans got from those prehistoric liaisons beyond babies. How do traces of the Neanderthal within shape the appearance, health, or personalities of living people? So that's the research. There is a figure that's being bandied about that Europeans are, have 4% of the Neanderthal genome. But you know that could change in tomorrow. Interestingly, Anne Gibbon is South African. And she apparently studied 
at Africa's premier university, the University of Cape Town. Uh, and, and, and so she was here and then went on and did, she did a master's here. So she did a BSc in KwaZulu-Natal, a master's at UCT, a PhD at UWC, and then moved on to the Max Planck Institute in, in Germany. And she's in the lab of a man called Savante Pabo. And Savante Pabo is another superstar. He has found a way of isolating DNA from fossils and analyzing it. And he was the one who described the Denisovan first. OK. So now, just talk a bit about Lucy. Look at her. She was almost complete when they laid her out. And she was found by a man um, by Donald Johansson of the Cleveland, Cleveland Museum of Natural History. So they call her Lucy of Hadar. She was found in 1974, and they, she was an Australopithecine, just like Dart's Australopithecine, but of a different species, an Afarensis, not an Africanus. Whether they could mate or not, I don't know, if they met. But here's another man, Robert Broom. He was a Scottish South African doctor and paleontologist. He qualified as a medical practitioner in 1895 and received his DSC in 1905 from the University of Glasgow. This was another very strange man. He worked every day. And, and, and if you read Martin Meredith, Martin Meredith says, let us pay a tribute to these people who are trying to find the secrets of humanity because they would go out into the most hostile of areas in the most hostile climatic conditions and put themselves on the ground in the hot sun and take a toothbrush and painstakingly try and expose a fossil. I mean, it's remarkable. And even more remarkable is that Robert Broom went out in his suit, his waistcoat, and his tie. And apparently when he had to cross a river, he lifted his pants, he kept his shoes on, and he just crossed. He was totally oblivious. He was just so fascinated and focused on wanting to find fossils. But he was the character. Robert Broom, a Scottish... His discoveries, he was the first one to stand up and say, I support Raymond Dart. I don't care what those people in Europe say. And that, that was pretty brave of him, okay? And he helped establish Australopithecines as a significant category of human ancestors, okay? Now, he was a genius and a rogue. He worked in the Karoo. He collected skeletons of Khoi Khoi tribesmen, right? In 1903, he was a professor of geology at Victoria College, Stellenbosch. He was a curator of fossil vertebrates at the South African Museum in Cape Town. He raided graves, and he sold fossils from the museum. Okay, he found Boscop Man in 1913 in Poch, and that was very controversial, because on that one skull, they decided, well, this must be the ancestor of local people. So he sided with Dart, and he was the keeper of Transvaal Man through Jansmans. He was a friend of Jan Smutzman. And he, at Sturkfontein, he made his very big find of this one, which was an Australopithecus, and it came to be known as Mrs. Plez. And recently they found that Mrs. Plez was actually Mr. Plez. <laughs> okay? And he also made the find of those species that I so, showed you, which were herbivores and which had very strong jaws and could crunch through almost anything and which became extinct, the Paranthropus robustus. So Crom Dry is where he found it, a birthplace of Paranthropus in the cradle of humankind, a South African heritage site. Okay, so Broom was a friend of Jan Smuts. He accepted evolutionary theory, but he believed that races were separate creations. Okay. And he amassed a huge collection of skeletons to prove his theory, exchanging these with scientists overseas. Now, I just don't want to go too much into Broom's life, but he would actually get a, a skeleton, chop off its head, and boil it in a pot next to a pot of boiling soup. 
He, he was that eccentric, it didn't actually matter to him. And uh, if you read Darwin's hunch, it does make very interesting but very unpleasant reading about the lengths to which this man would go to procure a skull. Okay? Now his belief, and the belief generally even of Dart, was that the African was a separate race, subhuman and a divergence from a white Caucasian prototype. Okay? So according to Dart, South Africa harbored the pre-human stock from which the human race itself derived a curiosity that will throw light on links between primates and human beings. In this case, read as the status of those of white origin. So for those who celebrated the national and international standing of the research into origins here in South Africa, only to learn that the history and the methodology and thinking behind these studies was inhumane and racist comes as a root shock. Okay, and then there was the third superstar. Now this man, I actually came to learn about in 1972 as a first year university student. Okay? And I was absolutely fascinated with him because you do know that because of apartheid, I wasn't allowed to come to the University of Cape Town. I had to go to a university college for Indians, which eventually became the University of Durban Westford. So I went to that university and registered for a science degree. And then there was a student there who was 10 years older than the average first year because he just, his parents just couldn't afford to send him. So he went and worked and he saved some money and he came to university. So he was 10 years older than the ordinary fresher. His name was Abdul Samad Bemat. Now Abdul Samad Bemat used to want to hang around with me and I was actually very uncomfortable with it because I had some other interests and didn't want to be with Abdul Samad Bemat. But one night he got hold of me and he says to me, Mal, do you, have you heard of Philip Tobias? And I said, no, who's he? And he began to tell me, well, I, he said I was interviewed by this man. Now at that time at these universities, these separate universities, there were protests almost every week against apartheid. And he said to me, you should read Philip Tobias and see what he's like. But when he interviewed me, I found this man to be absolutely wonderful. He said, and when I walked into his office, I was awestruck by all the books around, and he had on his wall a painting of Avicenna, or Ibn Sina, the Muslim uh, polymath. Of, the, uh, of, of I think it was the 12th or 13th centuries. If you know anything about Islamic history and the golden age of Arabic science, you will know about Ibn Sina. And I said, but Tobias is white, Avicenna was black. Why would he have a portrait of, uh, a painting of Avicenna? He says, read about this man and you'll get to know him. So I started reading about Tobias and I never stopped. I never stopped and I eventually reviewed he, one of his books, okay? And in that book I said, this book is littered with interesting snippets and photographs from Tobias's rich life. His love for his students and the pride he took in their careers. His love for autobiography and biography, philosophy, comparative religion, and most interestingly, detective thrillers, something he shared with the late Mary Leakey, since they both sought clues in old bones, like detectives unraveling a crime. One is left in excited anticipation of the account of Littlefoot, one of the most complete Australopithecine skills ever discovered. Now, Philip Tobias was an amazing man. He had a sense of social justice, right? Now, we were there at Westville in a time of protests, and there was a lot of hostility an anti-white feeling around. And here I was asked <clears throat> to look at the life of a white man and how he thought. And, uh, and he was a professor at one of the universities. And I learned that he was the president of New South in 1948 as an undergraduate. He was involved in the return to South Africa of the remains of Sati Bhatman. He showed that the San, like the rest of humanity, had 46 chromosomes. This was a controversial point in those days. People felt that the San were not quite human. And he said, no, no, they have 46 chromosomes like us. And this was a serious blow to racist thinking. He regularly protested for 40 years against apartheid's government exclusion of blacks from universities. 
and with others, he brought to account those responsible for the untimely death of the black consciousness leader, Steve Biko. And when he died, the tributes all over the world for him, okay? But for me, at that time, in 1972, he wrote The Meaning of Race, and I read this with absolute fascination, that here was somebody saying that the whole IQ thing is questionable because you cannot take a child from a township who's been deprived of education and give that child the same IQ test that you will give the child, uh, another child from a middle class suburb. It just doesn't work. So he wrote this and he wrote IQ and the nature nurture controversy. And I was, I mean, I was taken, I uh, thought he was, he was just too, too wonderful. So in 1972, the very year I'm talking about, he wrote this meaning of race, that science has offered no confirmation that some races are superior to others, and I was ecstatic, okay? In his Nature Nurture Controversy, he suggested that innate differences in, in intelligence, as measured by IQ tests, were invalid in an unequal socioeconomic environment. All this was music to my ears as a young idealist. Here was a white professor at a leading South African institution expressing radical views so bravely in the face of a racist and brutal regime, and more surprisingly, one of a Jewish background acknowledging the Muslim, Ibn Sina, in the face of Israeli-Palestinian tensions. How very amazing that he was on our side. I took his meaning of race and I began to show it to everybody on campus. So, Christian Kuljan has written about him, but she might have somewhat tempered my decades of admiration for Tobias because she made a deeper analysis of Tobias's confusion about race at some stage. But I am mindful of the cultural and political context of the period covered in that history. Why did I, Philip Tobias, rage against apartheid? He, he once asked, is it if anybody's concerned what I believe about the expanding universe or atomic theory? No, they're neutral theories, politically and emotionally. But race is not neutral. It's heavily charged emotionally and politically, full of unsound and dangerous meanings. Millions have been murdered, others deprived of basic human rights through racism. In South Africa, it becomes the duty of a scientist who makes a study of race to inform the public of her or his findings in research. I shall be failing in my academic duty if I did not say anything. He worked with bones fossils and modern anatomy, and they were not black or white, okay? And so the contradictions in his thinking, and I don't want to read this uh, entire s uh, slide, he, in, in, in about 1978, it was still, Kuljian says she found it preposterous that he still referred to people as living fossils, since they did not represent the survival of an otherwise extinct species, okay? And he always reverted to type although he had no proof that the races were different. Now, eventually he became world famous for the description, as I told you earlier, of Homo habilis. It was the first time that a fossil in Africa was found that was given the genus Homo, it was a human being, okay? So let's just go back and go back to um, our original, at the point of, just after the point of uh, divergence, you had Adipithecus, and then as you move up, you had Afarensis, which was Lucy, which was three million years old, okay? And then these were found in Kenya and Ethiopia. Australopithecus africanus, which was less than three million years old, right, was found in South Africa. There were a lot of other species along the way. Okay. Then, in Ethiopia, a jaw was found in Hadar, in Ethiopia, and that jaw was considered to be the jaw of an ancestor which would have gone directly to Homo habilis, up here, which was described by Tobias. But, while this was all, uh, all, all happening, Lee Berger comes along and finds Australopithecus sediba, and he says, this should have been described as a homo. Proposed, he proposed the view of homo origins, but it wasn't. 
but he said it was the direct it was direct in the line of ancestry so this confusion carries on and just when you've drawn this nice fancy diagram placing things in order of location and time of finding and age of the skull somebody else comes up with another finding and it is it, it, it disrupts the whole thing but what is interesting here is that Species, different species lived or, or their times on this continent overlapped. Even here, when we right comes to us, we lived with Homo neanderthalus. We had intercourse with Homo neanderthalus and we have their genes in us. So yesterday I was telling you about us carrying genes of bacteria and viruses. Now I'm telling you that even right up to the time we became human, we were also carrying genes of other species. Okay? So, Sedeba was argued for by Lee Berger, sitting over here. He's an American. Who's, he's now the, the, the head of the department at WITS, right? And he said it was a unique experience in human evolution. He says here that look at its hand, right? Its thumb is not like the thumb of an ape, okay? The creature's long thumb and short fingers show signs of a precision grip, and we're gonna discuss this tomorrow when we talk about Raymond Tellus. So it shows the signs of a precision grip involving thumb and fingers, but not the palm. The pelvis suggested the biomechanics of walking played a bigger role in its development than the demands of childbirth and the need to accommodate larger brained infants. It's coming closer and closer to the genus Homo. The ankle joint is largely like a human's, but its heel and shin bone appear to be mostly ape-like. So whenever they describe these fossils, they say so much of it is ape and so much of it is human. <laughs> okay? And in this case, the brain, Australopithecus sedibus cranium suggests its grapefruit-sized brain was starting to develop more advanced neural structures. So we've come a long way from the point of divergence five million years ago, from Ramidus to Afarensis to Africanus to Sediba. All these were Australopithecines. They were our ancestors, and we don't know which was our direct ancestor. Then the Homo genus comes along, Homo erectus, which migrated out of Africa and gave rise to your Denisovans and your uh, Neanderthals. And then in Africa, we had the emergence of Homo sapiens, which then 70,000 years ago made another migration, which eventually colonized the planet and they are our ancestors. And so, the idea of one race comes into being. Okay, so Tobias's views evolved with time. To his credit, he felt that there was no scientific basis for hierarchies in living races. He is to be credited with the identification and naming of Homo habilis for the Leakeys. His membership of New South as an undergraduate in 1948 his efforts to have the remains of Sarah Bartman returned to her birthplace, and his involvement in the Steve Biko inquest, his work to show that the sand, like the rest of humanity, had 46 chromosomes and was a serious blow to racist thinking. Tobias publicly stated in 2002 that exploitation of alleged racial superiority has no scientific basis. Okay? I am an African. This is a story of how far we have come not only from the deepest of time in terms of our ancestry, but as a nation who grappled with the inhumanity of apartheid and racism of the 20th century, compounded with the scientific endeavors, 